Welcome to the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh's Case Notes podcast. Over the next few months, we're going to delve into the different physician branches or specialties. Just to start off with, what is a physician? Most people know what a GP is and what a surgeon is, but not everyone knows exactly what a physician does. Well, the formal description is specialists in internal medicine, so diseases and complaints that happen inside your body. And even if that sounds unfamiliar, you've almost certainly heard of a lot of the areas that this covers, like cardiology, diabetes, allergies, palliative care, infectious disease and neurology. These are all branches of medicine or specialties that physicians are responsible for. In each coming episode of Case Notes, we will pick one of these specialties and delve into its history, looking at its development over hundreds of years and some of the interesting stories and cases from the past. We'll also talk to a current physician working in that area to find out what it is like to be working as a specialist physician in the 21st century. Hematology is the study of blood and blood disorders. The word hematology comes from the Greek root for blood, hyma, which also appears in other blood-related words such as hemorrhage and hematoma. And it is from ancient Greece that we also have one of the first recorded theories about blood and its purpose in the human body. Hippocrates, born around 460 BCE, first referred to blood as one of the humours in his humoral theory in which he said there were four essential bodily fluids, or humours, yellow bile, black bile, phlegm, and blood. He posited that in a healthy body, the humours were in balance, but an extreme excess or deficiency of any one of these would indicate illness. Each humour was centred in a specific organ, and was thought to correspond to particular characteristics, such as a season, an element, or a temperament. Blood, for example, was meant to be produced by the liver. It represented air and was the hot and wet humour that made some people sanguineous. Galen, personal physician to the Emperor Marcus Aurelius and one of the most prolific writers on medicine in ancient Rome, added to the idea of humours with his theory of opposites. This suggested that the humours could be rebalanced by applying the opposite characteristics. For example, too much blood, which was hot, could be cured by eating something cool. Other treatments to restore the balance involved herbal remedies, bathing or purging, where patients were given emetics or laxatives to purge the body. But perhaps the most well-known treatment was bloodletting. Like humoral theory, bloodletting also originated in the ancient world, spreading from Egypt to Greece, where physicians believed illnesses stemmed from an overabundance of blood key to this theory was the concept, perpetuated by Galen, that blood was created in the liver and then used up. It was thought that blood stagnated in the extremities, causing illness, and so bloodletting would remove this excess blood, or plethora, from the patient. The Persian scholar and physician Ibn al-Nafis first discovered the pulmonary circulation of blood in the 13th century. He explained that the construction of the heart contradicted Galen's claims, and accurately described how blood flowed from the right side of the heart to the left side through the lungs. However, Al-Nafis's discovery remained largely unknown in Europe. It wasn't until 1628 when William Harvey first published his discovery of systemic circulation in De Mortu Cordis that Galen's theories about blood were widely discounted. Harvey performed detailed experiments to calculate the volume of blood flowing through the heart, demonstrating that the body was incapable of producing or consuming the amount Galen had suggested. Harvey concluded that rather than being burned up and replaced by the liver, blood circulated around the body and returned to the heart through the veins. He also surmised that blood moved from the arteries to the veins via tiny blood vessels, Because they couldn't be seen by the naked eye, the existence of these capillary blood vessels wasn't confirmed until much later in the 17th century. 
Despite Harvey's huge contribution to anatomical understanding, bloodletting persisted as the standard treatment for various conditions across Europe. Practitioners typically pierced veins or arteries in the forearm or neck with a small surgical instrument such as a lancet or fleam. Other, more localised methods involved scarification with cupping and leeches to draw out the blood. By the late 18th and early 19th century, studies by prominent physicians began to discredit the practice and new treatments and technologies had largely edged out bloodletting. But back to the physician's understanding of blood. Advances in the development of lenses in the late 17th century allowed for several discoveries about the nature of blood. With little formal education, but a curious mind and an obsession for microscopes, Anthony van Leeuwenhoek, a Dutch shopkeeper, was the first to give a real description of red blood cells. In his book, Microscopical Observations, published in 1674, he stated, The red globules of blood I reckon to be 25,000 times smaller than a grain of sand. At the same time, Italian physician Marcello Malpighi, who also identified red blood corpuscles in his work De Polypo Cordis, was demonstrating the presence of small blood vessels called capillaries, which connect veins and arteries. Malpighi also made advances in the understanding of blood coagulation by examining the constituent parts of blood clots. He described blood as being formed of a serum and a dense matter, which he called coagulum identifying that it was the dense matter which was involved in blood coagulation. One of the first British texts concerning the scientific analysis of blood was by scientist Robert Boyle, who is widely recognised as a pioneer of the modern scientific method. His Memoirs for the Natural History of Human Blood, first published in 1684, was crucially important for its assertion that blood could be subjected to chemical analysis. It collated accounts of Boyle's experiments and suggested several separate areas for investigation, including the colours, taste, odours, heat and inflammability of blood, as well as its specific gravity, medicinal uses and the differences between the blood of different groups of people. In experiments similar to Boyle's, scientists were investigating the idea of blood transfusion, injecting subjects with the blood of animals or other humans and observing its effects. Often, the results described reveal signs and symptoms of a hemolytic transfusion reaction. This is a serious, sometimes fatal reaction, where the red blood cells given during a transfusion are destroyed by a person's immune system. It is most commonly triggered by an incompatibility in ABO blood groups. Due to the unpredictable outcome of transfusions in this period, they were prohibited by the British Parliament in 1678. However, in 1818, obstetrician Dr. James Blundell invented an instrument for transfusing blood and carried out a successful transfusion to a mother who had suffered postpartum hemorrhage. Blood was drawn from her husband with a syringe and successfully injected into the patient. Blundell also concluded that only human blood can be transfused to another human being. Perhaps the biggest influence in the history of haematology as a practice was Gabriel Andral, a French pathologist and professor at the University of Paris. Andral pursued laboratory studies in blood analysis and participated in the establishment of clinical haematology as a separate branch of pathology. His work, Essai d'hematologie pathologique, published in 1843, significantly expanded the existing knowledge of primary blood diseases and disorders. He invented the terms anemia and hyperemia, and clearly described a number of diseases of the blood, including lead poisoning, septicemia, and polycythemia. However, one of the biggest discoveries in haematology didn't come until 1901, when Karl Landsteiner, an Austrian scientist, discovered blood groups. Landsteiner would later be awarded the Nobel Prize for his identification of three different blood groups, A, B and O. Two students who worked with Landsteiner discovered the fourth human blood group, A, B, just a year later in 1902. The consequences of this discovery are of enormous importance, leading to further blood group discoveries such as the rhesus factor, 
and ensuring that transfusions only occur between people with compatible blood groups. In the 1930s, there were several advancements in the storage of blood, and in 1937, the USA and UK both set up their first blood banks. The outbreak of World War II in 1939 saw an enormous need for blood transfusions, and donation centres were set up across Britain. American surgeon and researcher Dr. Charles Drew developed techniques for preserving blood plasma, which could be stored significantly longer than whole blood. He also set up the Blood for Britain campaign, which met the need for blood to treat those wound wounded during the Blitz. In 1946, after the war ended, the Ministry of Health took control of blood banks in the UK and set up the National Blood Transfusion Service, made up of regional blood centres. Blood transfusions are needed if a patient has a shortage of red blood cells, either because they've lost a lot of blood, because their body isn't making enough red blood cells, or because they have a condition which affects the way red blood cells work, such as sickle cell disease or thalassemia. Now, Blood used in transfusions is thoroughly screened to make sure that it doesn't carry any infection from the donor. This type of screening began in 1986, following the identification of HIV and AIDS at the beginning of the decade. However, in the 1970s and 1980s, prior to thorough screening practices, it's believed thousands of patients worldwide were infected by contaminated blood and blood products. The full consequences of these cases are still coming to light. Launched in 2018, the ongoing Infected Blood Inquiry is investigating the circumstances that led to the widespread use of infected blood in the UK. One contributing aspect was the treatment of certain blood disorders with pharmaceutical factor concentrate products. These had been commercially manufactured with unscreened blood plasma harvested from known at-risk groups. The history of haematology reveals the specialism as a broad and still evolving field of medicine. Although the scientific analysis of blood has been possible for hundreds of years, it was initially a difficult, lengthy process which often produced unreliable results. But what can a modern haematologist tell us about the specialism today? How has the study of blood and treatment of blood disorders changed in more recent years? So, hello, and uh, thank you for joining us here today. We have Dr. Mary Copeland here with us. Um, so could we start off with you just telling us a bit about who you are and where you work? So I'm Mary Copeland. I'm Professor of Translational Haematology at the University of Glasgow. Um, and I also work at the Beetson West of Scotland Cancer Centre, um, specialising in patients with leukaemia. Thank you. So I guess if we just start with the absolute basics, what is haematology? So haematology is the study of blood disorders, um, both benign and malignant blood disorders. Uh, so some examples of benign blood disorders might be sickle cell anemia or iron deficiency anemia um, or vitamin deficiencies such as uh, folic acid deficiency. Uh, examples of malignant haematology disorders would include leukemias, lymphomas, myeloma. But in addition to the haematology sort of specific diagnoses, a, a part of what we do is understanding how the blood system is affected by other systemic diseases. Thank you. That's a that's a really helpful definition. So following on from that, I'm just curious. What is the difference between a haematologist, and I'm not going to be able to pronounce this one, a haemopathologist? What are those two very, very different um, areas? So within the UK, they're probably not too different. So within the UK, a haematologist is um, somebody who practices clinical haematology as well as laboratory based haematology. So within the career path for haematology, um, those of us who, who choose that path, we are accredited by both the Royal College of Physicians as well as the Royal College of Pathologists. So we have dual accreditation. Um, Hematopathologist within the UK is likely to be somebody that's only accredited in pathology or who has chosen to solely um, specialise in laboratory-based haematology. 
In other countries within Europe or the States, then hematology or clinical hematology and hematopathology are considered as separate specialties. So you would have different people looking after the patients as compared to, to the people doing the laboratory-based hematology work. Thank you. I knew I wasn't going to be able to pronounce that second one right. So thank you very much for that. So is there anything about the work that you do about your specialty that would surprise people? Or are there any sort of stereotypes or misconceptions around the work that you do? So I think one thing that's quite a big misconception, especially within the UK, is that a lot of people think acute leukemia mainly affects children and actually it carries a good prognosis which for the majority of children it does, but actually it's quite rare in children where it's the most common malignancy in children. Acute leukemias are actually much more common in adults and carry a very poor prognosis. So I think that's a big misconception. And with an aging population as well, the incidence of leukemias is increasing, of acute leukemias is increasing. And as more people are surviving, other forms of cancer, then this is a big risk factor for the development of leukemia in later life as well. Thank you very much. That's really interesting. And, and yeah, it's, it, I, I also had that stereotype in my head. So it's, it's very useful to, yeah, to dispel it. So I'm going to ask you some questions now, which will reveal just how little I know about this, this subject. Um, so just, just starting with the real basics, I suppose, what is blood made of? Oh, right. So, um, so blood is, is made up of a number of different cell types, uh, as well as a carrying fluid called plasma. So the different cell types that are found in blood are, are red blood cells that carry oxygen to the tissues, white blood cells to fight infection, and they're broken down into um, neutrophils, um, eosinophils and basophils, which fight bacterial infection, and lymphocytes, um, which tend to fight viral infections. Um, in addition, there are platelets, which are important for the blood clotting, um, and they are the first component. Um, if you cut yourself, they, they go to the area of the cut and they kind of stick in that area to kind of plug the hole. Um, so in addition, in the fluid component of the blood, this is called uh, plasma. And this carries a number of proteins um, that are in, involved in um, all different aspects of the human biology. So there's clotting factors. There's also proteins such as albumin, which carry drugs and hormones around the body. So the blood is a really complex um, complex um, liquid, which is absolutely essential for life. That's really bringing up some memories of biology classes at school. <laughs> it's, it's, I've definitely been told that before, but thank you. That was, that's very helpful. So in a similar sort of vein, why is iron considered to be good for the blood? So iron is an essential part of hemoglobin, um, which is used to carry oxygen within the red blood cells. So without iron, you develop anemia um, and you can't carry enough organ, you can't carry enough oxygen to your tissues. Um, and when that happens, you become more tired, you might get breathless, you might get palpitations. So iron is absolutely critical um, to um, maintaining a healthy blood system. And, and people that uh, develop iron deficiency anemia they, they may do this through a number of reasons so they may um, not have enough iron in their diet so for example somebody that's vegetarian or vegan needs to consider um, an alternative source of iron and um, some people um, who may be on certain medications such as aspirin may have a little bit of bleeding from their bowel every day as a result of the aspirin or if they have an ulcer or sometimes women with very heavy periods can also develop iron deficiency anemia. So there's a number of different ways it can be caused, but iron is absolutely essential for the, the healthy working of the body and the delivery of oxygen to the tissues. Thank you so much. I'm definitely learning a, a lot today. 
So you, you've touched already on sort of the, the many different aspects of, of the sort of work that you do, but I wondered, is it possible to talk us through a, a typical day in the life of, of your work and of your experiences, or, or is there just no such thing because it's so varied? So, so it, it is very varied and there's lots of different paths you can take within haematology. So for example, I'm, I'm a clinical academic. So my days split between the university where I do research and I do teaching and I do clinical trials, as well as seeing patients on the ward and doing clinics. Some, somebody that works within the NHS, the, their work is going to be ward and clinic based, as well as doing the laboratory based haematology. So looking at blood films down the microscope, helping with blood transfusion problems, um, helping with clotting problems, and also doing consultative haematology on the ward. So where a patient that's come in under another specialty has a problem, then the, the haematologist will be able to provide advice. Another important area for providing advice is, is those patients that um, go to theatre or are injured and have major haemorrhage. So haematologists are really important in advising how those patients are treated. And also during pregnancy, sometimes there can be problems with blood group mismatching between the mother and the father, and there can be a problem with the baby. Um, so that's another important area of um, advice for haematology. Thank you. So you obviously find the work that you do very interesting. I'm curious to know how you got here. You know, what, at what point did you decide to specialize in haematology? And, and was, there, was there an inspiring person or a eureka moment that sent you down this path? So I, um, th throughout medical school, I wasn't entirely sure what I wanted to do until I got to my final year at medical school. And then I did a haematology block where um, we looked after patients on the ward and I found that really rewarding and, and what I really liked about haematology was that right from diagnosis through to either cure or long-term management or even palliative care you look after the haematology patients so you look at the blood film down the microscope you look at the bone marrow down the microscope you decide on the treatment path and you follow up the patient indefinitely once they've decided on that treatment path. So you get to know your patients really well. It's also a very scientific discipline and I think I'm quite sort of scientifically minded. So I really enjoy that aspect of it and understanding the different disease processes that are involved as, as well as how, how the sort of new drugs that are coming along work and how we might be able to use those to help patients. Thank you. So, you know, given all your experiences that you've talked about, are there any particular cases or diseases that are kind of stuck with you as being important or interesting over the course of your career? So, so I, I personally have a particular interest in chronic myeloid leukemia, um, which is a single gene disorder which results from an abnormal chromosome called the Philadelphia chromosome. This condition was actually first described in Edinburgh in 1845 by John Hughes Bennett, who's a very famous haematologist. Um, and it leads to very high white blood cell counts and an enlarged spleen. And without treatment, this, this condition is fatal. So, so I have a specific interest in that. And recent developments in the last 20 years have converted CML from being a usually fatal disorder um, to a condition that's now considered a chronic illness um, with the management of a drug that um, specifically inhibits the Philadelphia chromosome. So, so, so that's really interesting. Another aspect that for me is very interesting is the, the realization increasingly that a substantial minority of leukemias are actually inherited and that's that's quite new. So we are seeing families where there's clusters of cancers and leukemias. And I think that's something that we need to investigate a lot more to um, better understand that more people probably have an inherited risk to developing cancer or, le or leukemia. And we could be screening those patients uh, earlier and picking things up more quickly. 
Thank you. That's really fascinating. And it, it, it may turn out that the next couple of things I'm going to ask you are things that you've essentially already answered in other questions, but I'll, I'll ask you anyway, in case there's in case there's more you'd like to say. So what are some of the most common blood conditions that you have treated or diagnosed in your work? So probably the most common blood conditions overall are anemias, um, whether it's iron deficiency anemia or anemia related to vitamin B12 or folate deficiency, they are very common. Um, also see um, a lot of patients maybe with low platelet counts, which can be what's called autoimmune. So maybe following a viral infection or a drug treatment, um, the, the platelet count drops and, and it will usually recover. So they're sort of common benign hematology conditions. Within the malignant hematology conditions, obviously I look after patients with chronic myeloid leukemia. So I see a lot of patients with that, but I also look after teenagers and young adults with acute leukemia and lymphomas. Um, so I'd say those are the sort of main conditions that, that I look after. Thank you. So you might not be old enough to really answer my next question, but over the course of your working career, have you seen kind of significant changes to, to how haematology is practiced and, and the sort of outcomes that you're seeing? So, so definitely. So within the last 20 to 30 years, I would say there have been substantial improvements in how different types of malignant um, blood cancers um, have been managed. So for example, in the mid 1990s, a, a drug called rituximab was introduced, which is a, a monoclonal antibody, which specifically targets the malignant B lymphocytes within that condition. And that revolutionized the treatment of lymphoma. Um, because it um, was a targeted therapy, so it allowed for reductions in treatment toxicity, as well as developing more effective treatment. Then, as, as I mentioned, there was the introduction of the tyrosine kinase inhibitors that specifically target chronic myeloid leukemia cells, and they've converted CML to being a long-term illness, which is controlled by a, a tablet once a day, as compared to a fatal condition. More recently, we're seeing a lot more precision medicine-based approaches. So drugs are being developed to specifically target genetic lesions um, that are specific to particular types of leukemia. And we're also seeing more immunotherapies, so, so drugs that are stimulating the immune system to fight back against the cancer cells. Over the last 20 years for other conditions such as myeloma and chronic lymphocytic leukemia, many, many new drugs have been developed or repurposed from elsewhere. And that means that rather than patients succumbing to these illnesses within five years, some of these patients are surviving 15 to 20 years from diagnosis. And um, so they may not be cured, but these conditions are increasingly enabling patients to live for quite a long time, usually with reasonably good quality of life. Thank you. Um, so, so we've covered the, the past and we've also done the, the present. So I'm interested to hear your perspective on the future. So what will haematology look like, do you think, in, in 10 or 20 years time? So I think in terms of malignant haematology, I, th I think we will have a much more patient orientated precision medicine approach where we have individualized treatments for each patient. We will have a much better understanding of the molecular biology underlying different blood cancers and that will enable us to provide this much more individualized approach. Thank you. So, you know, logically following on from the future are, are the doctors of the future. And there may be people listening to this podcast who are at school thinking about studying medicine or who are students studying medicine and are thinking about how to specialise. So I'm interested to find out if you have any thoughts on, you know, what, what they can do to pursue a career, particularly in medicine, but also obviously in, in haematology. Are, are there any tips or advice that you can give to anybody listening? So I, mean, I think haematology is a great specialty to um, enter. 
there's a, a massive range of different opportunities within the discipline from laboratory based medicine right through to you know sort of front line looking after acute leukemia patients doing bone marrow transplant um, it can be a specialty that's quite difficult to get experience of either during medical school um, or the early years as a doctor, just because it's quite a complicated specialty in terms of the patients involved um, and how complicated their, their histories are. But I would say if you get opportunities to attend ward rounds or um, do a, a specialist module within haematology, I would definitely encourage you to take that up. And, and as well, haematologists are always really keen to speak to medical students and school children. And for medical students, we're always happy to take students doing electives, um, even from other universities, um, to learn a bit more about haematology. Thank you. So I guess kind of following on from that, what, what makes a good haematologist in your perspective? Are there particular skills that are that are particularly useful for, for your specialty, do you think? So I, I would say be, because of the nature of the conditions that you're dealing with and how emotive they are, um, and that unfortunately not all patients have a good outcome, you need to have very good communication skills um, to communicate with the patient and their family. You also need to be quite resilient um, to develop coping mechanisms to deal with that. And in addition to that, you also need to enjoy science because it's a very rapidly moving forward field. Um, and you need to be able to keep up with the advances in order that you can understand how the treatments are changing and, and better able to serve your patients. Thank you. So we're, we're moving on now to, to my personal favorite bit, which is on the history side of things. Um, which is, I, I guess to start off with, you know, what are, what are the biggest advances or pivotal moments in the history of haematology that, that sort of seem, seem to resonate or of interest to you? So, so for me, I think probably, I probably mentioned these already, but the, the biggest one I would say is the introduction of allogeneic stem cell transplant in the late 1970s. So, so this is a procedure we, whereby we take uh, blood stem cells from another donor, which may be a family member or an unrelated donor, um, they are matched on specific proteins and then they're transplanted into a patient with a blood disorder. And often this procedure will cure the patient or either a form of blood cancer or sometimes an inherited condition such as um, thalassemia or sickle cell anemia. So that would be the first one. I, I think the next one uh, would be the introduction of antibody therapies. So as, as I mentioned, the rituximab, the anti-B lymphocyte antibody um, that's therapeutically used in lymphomas and chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So I think that's been a sort of revolutionizing treatment as well. And has also led to the development of many other antibodies to target not just lymphoma-like conditions, but also acute myeloid leukemia as well. And I think the third one would be the introduction of new drugs such as the imatinib and other drugs used to treat CML. But increasingly, we're also seeing similar drugs which are being used to treat other forms of um, leukemia. I think thinking about the future, there's a lot of focus on, on gene therapy and potentially replacing faulty genes and conditions as in, such as thalassemia and sickle cell anemia, but that's still quite experimental and it's not quite widely accepted yet. Thank you. So are there any particular people um, from, from the history of your specialty that kind of stand out as being, you know, the figures that you would look up to or, or remember as significant? So there are quite a few figures. I guess more recently, I would think of Professor John Goldman from the Hammersmith Hospital. So he um, was one of the pioneers of allogeneic stem cell transplant. He um, was also 
involved in setting up the transplant service and the CML service at the Hammersmith Hospital. Then there would be um, Professor Brian Drucker, who's based in uh, Seattle, who was um, a pioneer in the development of imatinib, which is used to treat chronic myeloid leukemia. And finally, a third person, I think, would be Professor David Grimwade, who is based um, at Guy's Hospital in London. Um, and he developed um, molecular techniques for monitoring low levels of leukemia in the blood and the bone marrow, which allow relapse to be picked up at a very early stage. Um, and that as well improves outcomes for patients. But depending on what sort of type of haematology you specialise in, the sort of people that you, you look up to will be different because it's such a varied specialty. Thank you. So, you know, th this this question it might be tricky given everything that you've just said about the about the variety. But I picture for a moment that I am given the money to set up a museum of medicine, and I am collecting one object from each specialty to represent the work that you do. What would be the object that you would select for haematology to to symbolise your work? Um, so I, th I think it, it could be one of two things. It, it could be um, a microscope for looking at the blood films and the bone marrow and to understand what's going on with the blood cells. Or it could be a bone marrow aspirate needle, which we use to sample the bone marrow from the back of the pelvis, because um, that then gives us access to understand what's happening within the bone marrow. So I think it would be one of these two objects if you were to put it in a museum. That's perfect. Thank you. Um, I recently interviewed a gastroenterologist who wanted a jar of poo. So I'm so pleased that you have said <laughs> an actual instrument and not human waste. So thank you. I don't want a jar of blood next to my jar yeah. of poo. Um, so we're coming towards the end now, but there's a, a question that can't really be avoided. So we're talking in uh, mid-April 2022. And of course, there's the COVID pandemic. So I'm interested to know, how has the pandemic affected your work? Has it changed the way that you do your job? So the, the pandemic has had massive effect on how I do my work. And I think probably how I do my work has changed permanently following the pandemic. So if I take the clinical side of my work, first of all, um, in the initial parts of the pandemic, the clinics were all cancelled it was really difficult because we just didn't want to put any of our patients at risk because of course haematology patients with blood cancers are at very high risk of having severe COVID disease and um, so we didn't want to risk bringing these patients up to hospital um, and infecting them with COVID. So we have put in place a number of um, things to protect patients. So for example, we all get screened once a week by PCR for COVID. We all wear masks, we all practice social distancing. Everything is cleaned between patients. Initially, we adopted um, telephone clinics. Um, so wherever possible, we would um, have telephone interviews with patients and if they needed medication, we would arrange for that to be couriered out to them. Um, However, that's not a satisfactory approach for all patients. And that now as we're getting through the pandemic, quite a lot of patients um, for the clinics would actually prefer to be seen face to face. We have more of a hybrid approach now where some patients come up to be seen face to face and some patients we, we manage by telephone clinics. And sometimes that's patient preference and sometimes it's our, our preference. Regarding the inpatients, this was incredibly difficult for them to start with because they weren't allowed any visitors. And for patients having chemotherapy for leukemia, they might be in the ward for four or six weeks at a time receiving therapy. So effectively, they were isolated during that time to protect them from getting an infection. So that, that was really difficult. More recently now, we have introduced... Um, sort of visiting and for the younger patients they can have a relative to stay with them and um, but both the patient and their visitors they, they need to be doing regular testing for COVID 
Obviously, the vaccination programme and the availability of lateral flow tests has, has provided huge reassurance as well to people in the community. So we, ha we have had huge changes. That, that there's also been some changes to the treatments that we offer during the pandemic. So we were offering less intensive therapies to some patients because the risk of COVID was considered to be more than the risk of the leukemia itself. If I then think about uh, how this affected our work within the laboratory and our research. So the research lab was completely closed for four months at the start of the pandemic until we had put in place all the safety procedures that we needed. At the same time, um, as I'm sure you'll know, there was a massive fall off in fundraising. So blood cancer and cancer charities, they saw their funding streams completely dry up. And as a result of that, there was much less funding available for leukaemia research. So we sort of really struggled, not just with trying to get the lab up and running again, but also trying to maintain our funding in order that we could continue to do leukaemia research. I'm delighted to say that we're now back on track and um, the lab is now up and fully functional. We still have social distancing in place within the lab but um, we are um, doing all our experiments and the funding situation is starting to improve. I guess the final aspect that I'd speak about would be clinical trials and, and clinical trials were devastated by the pandemic, not just that many trials were halted as a result of the pandemic, but many staff were reassigned to other um, areas of increased need and not all of them have come back to clinical trials. So clinical trials does con continue to struggle a bit, even as we hopefully are coming out of the pandemic. And I think that's one area where we do need to focus on improving resources and trying to get our, our clinical trials back to where they were pre-pandemic so we can continue to offer new treatments to patients. Thank you very much. So we're, we're coming to the end now, but before we finish up, is there anything that I haven't asked you that you wish you'd been asked or, or anything else you'd like to say that hasn't come up? I, I don't think so. I, I would just sort of highlight that haematology really is a great specialty and, and there's such a diversity of things that you can do with haematology. And I would really encourage everyone to think about it as a career path. Fantastic. Well, this is really fascinating. Thank you so much for joining us. For this week's case study, we'll be looking into the case of haemophilia in the royal family. Who was affected by the disorder and when did it first appear? Haemophilia is an X-linked recessive disorder which affects the body's ability to form blood clots an important process that reduces bleeding and allows the body to heal when injured. X-linked recessive disorders are inherited conditions which affect a gene on the X chromosome, and so haemophilia affects male patients much more frequently, as it takes both X chromosomes being affected in female patients for the condition to appear. Incidences of excessive or abnormal bleeding were first recorded hundreds of years ago, but it wasn't until the early 19th century that hemorrhagic bleeding disorders were recognised as running in certain families, and effective treatments weren't widely available until the early 20th century. Haemophilia became known as the royal disease because it spread to the royal families of Europe through Queen Victoria's descendants. It's often theorised that haemophilia appeared in the royal family due to a spontaneous mutation in Queen Victoria's DNA. Spontaneous mutations are the cause of about 30% of haemophilia cases. However, some historians have posited that there may have been undiagnosed haemophilia in the ancestors of Victoria's mother, Princess Victoria of saxe coburg salfeld as many boys in her family were fragile and died young. Queen Victoria is believed to have passed the trait on to three of her nine children. Her daughters, Princess Alice and Beatrice, carried the gene for haemophilia, but the condition first appeared in Victoria's son, Prince Leopold. Leopold was described as a delicate child and had several severe hemorrhages. He was diagnosed with haemophilia in childhood and had physicians in almost permanent attendance. 
Although the royal family carefully managed news about health matters, his attacks were described in both medical journals and newspapers at the time. In 1884, Leopold travelled to Cannes on the advice of his doctors. The trip was for the benefit of his health, as the winter climate in the UK aggravated his joint pain, a common symptom of haemophilia. Unfortunately, whilst at his residence in Cannes, Leopold fell and suffered a cerebral haemorrhage, which was exacerbated by his condition and proved fatal. Perhaps the most famous royal affected by the royal disease was Victoria's great-grandson, Alexei Nikolaevich, heir to the throne of the Russian Empire. Accounts of Alexei's birth suggest that his condition was apparent from the moment his umbilical cord was cut and wouldn't stop bleeding. He suffered several bad bleeds in childhood, and in many photographs he is posed with a box under one foot, thought to be because his knee joint was so severely damaged from bleeding that he wasn't able to straighten it. The family's determination to keep Alexei's illness a secret, and the limited medical interventions available at the time, compelled them to take controversial measures. Emperor Nicholas II and Empress Alexandra Fyodorovna attempted to treat their son's haemophilia with the help of divisive faith healer Grigory Rasputin. According to some historians, Rasputin's relationship with the royal family made the public increasingly suspicious of the regime, especially as the reasoning behind their favouritism was hidden. Rasputin used his close relationship with the Romanovs to influence bureaucratic affairs in his favour, which many believe hastened the Russian Revolution of 1917. Because the last known descendant of Queen Victoria, who had haemophilia, died in the 1940s, the exact type of haemophilia found in her royal line was unknown until 2009, when the remains of the Romanov family were identified. Using genetic analysis, specifically of Tsarevich Alexei, but also his mother and one of his sisters, scientists determined that the royal disease is actually haemophilia B. This rare subtype of haemophilia causes easy bruising and bleeding due to an inherited mutation of the gene for factor IX, resulting in a deficiency of the factor IX protein which helps blood to clot. Information about haemophilia in the royal family was managed for political reasons. However, as science became more aware of the condition and Victoria's extended family grew, the royal disease highlighted problems with the natural law of succession and weakened the reputation of dynasties. Thank you for listening to this Case Notes podcast. If you'd like to find out more about the work we do, you can visit our website at rcpe.ac.uk forward slash heritage. You can also find us on Twitter at RCPE Heritage. And we have a Just Giving page, RCPE Heritage, linked to on our website if you'd like to support our work and help to fund future podcasts. Thank you.